Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our, our October faculty development session. I'm Dr. Jessica Seaman, academic success consultant for GME here in Phoenix. I'm also the co-chair of the Alliance Faculty Development Committee. Our committee strives to create and deliver effective sessions that support you, our diverse faculty, as leaders in educational ex excellence. With that mission in mind, we have another timely presentation for you today that we're really excited about, Teaching Across Social Identities, delivered by Dr. Erica Kirby. As you know, Creighton faculty work with learners of multiple identities, so it's important we teach, communicate, and give feedback in a way that respects and honors the intersectional identities of our learners and how this impacts and enriches our learning environments. Last week, I participated in a virtual religious conference where speakers were discussing this very topic, and one speaker shared the following. The culture of Christ unites rather than divides. It heals rather than harms. We live in a moment of particularly strong divisions. However, we still can commit to achieving unity. We are all aware that we can do better. This is our challenge in today's society. Unity and diversity are not opposites. We can be unified and celebrate diversity. As a Jesuit university, Creighton is the perfect place to celebrate diversity. And we're very excited to have Dr. Erica Kirby with us today as she shares with us how diverse identities can actually support our teaching and learning. Dr. Kirby is a professor of communication studies and the A.F. Jacobson Chair in Communication at Creighton University and a senior facilitator for the Anti-Defamation League. She studies the intersections of working and personal life, emphasizing how differing social identities, including race, class, and gender, intersect with organizational structures. She teaches several social justice courses and is currently teaching being color brave, race, privilege, oppression, and justice. Now, just a few housekeeping items. We will be recording this session for future reference. We do invite you to submit any questions in the Q&A tab. You will not have access to the chat, but you will have access to the Q&A tab. It will be monitored throughout the presentation and we'll answer as many as we can by the end of the session. Also, there will be a short five question survey that will automatically populate at the end of the webinar. And that is to help us in providing future sessions for you. So thank you in advance for providing us with your feedback. So Dr. Kirby, if you're ready, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. So I'm really excited to be with you today. And I know that um, Dr. Seaman is going to be putting into the chat um, a worksheet that you can download to be able to sort of follow along with me today. It has four sections to it. When I was thinking about how I might approach um, doing this session today with teaching across social identities, um, as someone who does this a lot to teach across any given teach about one, any given um, identity could be a session in and of itself. And so I just thought about like at a macro level, if I was wanting to think about sharing, um, teaching across identities, what might be the best way to do that? And so you'll see that I've divided our day into we're going to ground ourselves in identity for just a minute. And then we'll be talking about how to be mindful of social identities and then how to recognize barriers to interacting and teaching across identities. And then finally end up with like tips for interacting, teaching and learning across social identities. So the worksheet will be there to help you and for your, for your use afterwards, because basically anything that is in a slide is on the worksheet as a checklist. Another thing I wanted to say just to start, um, in addition to the worksheet and the approach is that I will be using mentoring and if you haven't used that before, um, it's like Slido or some of the other things that allow you to participate. So I'm hoping that you will also have your phones right by because I'm actually going to start right now with a mentee slide. So I'll show it to you and then explain it. So you just go to www.menti.com 
and use the code 8792584. And so the first question that I'm hoping some people will put some information in there on is just some for you to put in some words and you can put in up to two things. When you first meet someone, what can you tell about their identity by looking at them? I see we're starting to get it going. So we can look at someone and see race. Gender, background. I'll let it go for a while because it looked like we had quite a few people and I have seven in so far. So I'm going to let it go for just a second. I'm also noticing that someone said we can't tell anything about their identity just by looking at them. Okay, it slowed down a little bit. So temperament, hygiene, social status, maybe we could tell that by looking at somebody. We can sort of see how they appear. Um, mood, biological, gender are some of the things that you said we could be able to see. And then kind of the opposite, what can't you tell about someone's identity just by looking at them? And we'll be doing a lot of interaction because this is really the only way to do it is through Menti. So if you haven't pulled out your phone yet and you want to, please do. Okay, so everything is getting really big in terms of things we can't necessarily know. We can't know their thoughts, their language. And you see that there are some categories that we have put sort of across both that some people said you can see it. Other people have said maybe you can't see it. And so that's why I wanted to dive a little bit more into identity to start with concepts about like what really is visible and what might we not know. And we're going to do that um, in just a minute here. See if there's any last additions. Um, so I asked you the first two questions already and then just want you to think about as I'm transitioning to the little mini lesson from the Anti-Defamation League, this question. How do our assumptions about identity, so those things that we saw and maybe we think we know them, contribute to biased thoughts, attitudes, and stereotypes? So I am going to do a little, um, you're going to hear me not talk for a minute because I'm going to play a little bit of a mini lesson from the Anti-Defamation League. And if you've pulled up your worksheet, you can actually do this full lesson on your own later. It is a public, publicly accessible resource. I'm just going to, though, use it to start to introduce us to the idea of identity and then how at the ADL we often think about identity as an iceberg. And so you'll get to hear a little like robotic voice for a minute rather than mine. Here we go. We define identity as the qualities, beliefs, and affiliations that make up a particular person or group positioned in relation to other people or groups. Each of us has a unique identity with many facets. Think about all the different aspects of your identity that make up who you are. How much of your identity is visible to others the moment you meet? How much may not be visible ever or until someone learns more about you? So we started with those questions a little bit. Um, you'll see on your worksheet at the top, and then I'll, I'll bring the slide up again a little bit later, that I also, besides the ADL's definition, put another definition on there as well from yourdictionary.com that talks about identity as who you are, the way you think about yourself, the way you are viewed by the world, and the characteristics that define you. I'm going to go to a little bit deeper the metaphor that is sometimes used to talk about identity. 
Identity is a lot like an iceberg. Do you know what's surprising about icebergs? Only a small part of the iceberg, about one eighth or 13%, is visible above the waterline. Similar to an iceberg, just a few parts of a person's identity are immediately visible above the waterline. Some aspects of identity are right at the waterline, where we might see a characteristic but lack absolute certainty about it based only on what we observe. That means many dimensions of a person's identity are going to be below the waterline, where we cannot immediately see them. And so, so you'll notice here that above the waterline, really only a few things were like, we can know for sure what someone's wearing and their physical appearance. And then at the waterline is sort of this fuzzier area of like, well, maybe sometimes it shows and maybe it's not so apparent in terms of marital status or someone's religion. They might be wearing markers that help us know that. They may not. Um, some people in terms of socioeconomic status may be dressing in a certain way that we think we know, but not all of these are readily known. And then there's plenty of things that are below the waterline. So like for me right now, and I'm gonna do a modeling of this because you'll see on your worksheet that you can fill in above and at and below the waterline. And I was hoping that you will do just a little bit of that and then we're gonna share just one thing from it in Menti afterwards. So for me, above the waterline, you can only see me from about here up, but you can see that I have a nose piercing you can see that I have purple in my hair. That might make you think certain things, but it, it's, so biases might come with it, but those are the things that you could see. Um, at the waterline, I think I do present pretty white, so you would probably assume race to some extent um, and dress pretty feminine right now. So you might assume that I you know, identify as female, but I haven't told you that yet. And then below the waterline, let's see here, education, you wouldn't know by looking at me um, if Dr. Seaman hadn't told you already that I have a PhD, but also you wouldn't know that I'm a jazzercise instructor because that's not something that you can know just by looking at me. And so just for a minute while I transition back into Mentimeter and the slideshow, put in just a couple things per, above, at, and below the waterline. And here is what I would like us to do next. So we've seen the identity iceberg and you're entering some things. What is just one of your identities that is below the waterline? So it's interesting because we're getting things about personality, but also hobbies and interests that we wouldn't know. Maybe mental health conditions that you don't know by looking at someone. Immigrant, what my job is, what my nationality is, that I'm a single mom. Yes, I am too. And we wouldn't have known any of those things necessarily just by looking at people. And so we sort of start to think about these identities because a lot of times we might make assumptions about people's identities. So the first sort of section of your handout is being mindful of social identities. And um, it's easy to make assumptions about a person's identity that aren't necessarily accurate, especially with the identity aspects at the waterline, right? We might think initially that we know what those things are, like race or, or gender are identifiable and above the waterline, but these identifiers are more complicated than just what someone looks like. Even when you can clearly see someone's face, skin color, hair, body type, it's still possible to misidentify them based on characteristics 
that are observable. So for example, my daughter presents in very many of the same ways that I do, even down to like colored hair and um, a nose ring in the same place. All three of my girls, we all have that in the same place. But she identifies as she, they. So I could have even said they identify as she, they. And you wouldn't know that to look at her. And so that's that, it's that at the waterline that really gender identity is deeper than how she originally might present. And so when we think about being mindful of social identities, you've seen this definition already. And I would just want to say this, if we would not want others to make assumptions about our identities, we should not make assumptions about theirs. And so go back again to the iceberg and look and pick two identities that are most important to you. So around the iceberg, there's lots of different things we could identify with. What are a couple of the things that are most important to you? And once you've decided, you have a chance to enter two things here. If you would just please enter for me two identities that are very important to you. And Jessica, while people are thinking, are you seeing my whole screen or just the slide? I am seeing just the slide. Great. Of the question, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation. It helps so much to have at least a few ways to build in some interactivity. Okay, so something's coming forward. Mom has gotten big, so that means a few people have said it, right? If it's grown, values, gender, education, religion, we have a lot of different things and even people really making it personal in terms of an artist. Um, and then we do see spousal roles are on there as important to some people. Why would I even ask this? I would ask it because this first question, which of my social identities are most important to me and how might that influence my interactions? So if my social identity that's most important to me is that of being a mom, how does that influence my interactions? Does it inter influence my interactions with my students? I have had my students in the past call me Mama Curbs. And I'm sure it's because, right, that identity is important enough to me that I probably carry forth some of those behaviors and then they, they recognized it. And so thinking just about how social identities that are really important to us might influence our interactions and depending on which of those are, what does that look like? Some questions to sort of ask ourselves on top of that, what else do I need to learn about my own social identity groups if it's important to me, but maybe I don't know all of the things. Um, I didn't always teach race, justice, and social privilege classes, but certainly once I have, looking a lot more at whiteness, I've sure learned a lot. And then I didn't really need, that I didn't, I, it wasn't put in front of me to have to learn it before. So thinking about those identities that are important to us, and how they might influence our interactions is sort of step one, right? It's 101 about teaching across social identities is getting in touch with ourselves to also then lead to the second question. Have I ever experienced discomfort while interacting with members of other social identity groups? And if so, why is that? To start thinking about being mindful of our own identities as step one. And then, as you might imagine, there's a slide on being mindful of our students' identities. And so we started with knowing our own identities and maybe how we don't like it when people make assumptions about them for us. And so I said, if we don't want people to assume about us, we shouldn't assume about others. So a question to ask ourselves, am I making an assumption or assumptions about my students' social identities? I will say that I have to check myself to on the Omaha campus of Creighton 
not assume that many of at least my white students come from backgrounds of privilege because many, many do, but it doesn't mean that all do. And so I shouldn't go into interaction sort of thinking about socioeconomic status as this bracket through which I read them. And I'm sure that in Phoenix, you have some of the uh, some similar things that you would be thinking about in terms of assumptions about student social identities. And then we need to think about how might the social identities of my students be impacting their daily life experiences. And what do I mean by that? Think about your own social identities that you put forward. If you're an artist, or if you're a golfer, or if you're a mom, or any of those things, how they influence how you structure your life. Our hobbies, our daily routines, what we want to do in terms of entertainment, our job, there's an endless thing that our social identities impact every day. And so even if we think about a student right now that y'all might have, oh, and by the way, I'm not from the South, I just use y'all as a micro-inclusion, we'll talk about that later, um, who have the identity of parent. Students who have the identity of parent and how COVID has changed things for them in terms of whether or not kids are able to go to school or childcare and doing remote learning at home and the time that that's adding to people and the stress that that's putting on people. Like just being mindful of that could give us a different frame on viewing our students when we know those things. And so that's the other question. What else do I need to learn about my students and their social identity groups? So do we need to grow our empathy by thinking about things like, oh, how is living in a pandemic impacting my students and might be impacting their schoolwork? I just came out of a department meeting where that's what we talked about for the last 20 minutes was just how can we make things easier for our students? Because things are hard right now and they're hard for us as teachers too. Um, to grow our empathy, we want to listen to stories of people who maybe don't share our same experiences, or if it's a really different social identity category, read what they write, watch shows and movies about them. My first job um, out of my master's degree, I really sort of struggled to find some employment because I was 22 and had a master's degree and really didn't have any experience besides the kind of jobs that you have in college. And I ended up being a grant writer for um, Hmong National Development that worked with the refugees that came from Laos um, after the war. And I didn't know much about the Hmong at all, but I realized pretty quickly I need to find out, right, to be able to have interactions that are productive with this group of people because I just didn't really understand their reality, their social identity. And so thinking about this idea of assumptions that we might make about identity, this one you just have to agree or disagree. I have made an assumption about a student's social identity or identities at least once, and I would be answering strongly agree if I was there with y'all. Dr. Kirby, actually, yeah. I can see your whole screen now. You I can't, can't see your slide. I would not prefer that. Thank you for letting me know. Once we're done with this, I'll just hit a refresh okay. quick. Y'all. Great. Okay. So we are heading towards strongly agree. And I am going to escape to go to this and hit present mode again. Does that fix it? Perfect. Thank All you. right. Great. So most people had said that they strongly agree that they've made an assumption about a student's social identity at least once. For those of you who disagreed, I really admire that that's sort of never come into your thought processes. But for a lot of us, like it's just sort of automatic, right? We're going to talk about, um, just review about implicit bias in a minute because I know you've already had training on that. But a lot of these things just come sort of automatically. And so another thing to think about with being mindful of student identities what preconceived notions or stereotypes do I have about my students based on their social identity characteristics, whether we seem different or similar? So let's go back to if I pre have a preconception that a lot of my Creighton Omaha campus students are wealthy, is that a positive preconception for me, negative or neutral? What's the source of it? For me, a lot of it is walking through the parking lot and seeing the cars, but the students who aren't wealthy enough to have cars don't have a car there, right? So like that's again sort of messing up the process. And then will my preconceptions facilitate or impede interacting with this student? It's sort of like a check yourself, right? The, the first part here is like check yourself before you wreck yourself in terms of thinking about identity. And I would just say in this process to try to let go 
of any stereotypes you may have been holding and encourage an open mind for yourself and your students. It's not really an instant process, but like this consistency of like, oh, that was an assumption. Do I really know this? Oh, that was an assumption is going to help us change our mindsets. And so then once we have sort of done some reflecting on how mindful we are of our own identities and what's really important to us and how that might impact our interactions with students and their identities, then we can start to recognize barriers that might get in the way of teaching and interacting across social identities. And so on your worksheet, you will sort of see that page two was us going through those aspects of identity and page three now, and there's room for notes on all of it, is going through the barriers to interacting and teaching across social identities. And this next slide is just about bias, like I had um, sort of introduced before, because I know from talking to Dr. Seaman that you have had either been in the bias training or had an opportunity to be in it before. So I don't want to beat it to death, but we can't talk about identity without talking about implicit bias, at least bringing it into the conversation. And so these questions on your checklist, how are my explicit and implicit biases impacting how I see my students and their social identity groups? How am I thinking under the influence? Which TUI is, um, sort of what that's called. And I, I know that I said C. Allen on the worksheet because she is the person that came up with that phrase. And I really like it because we do think under the influence, just like we might do other things. And I don't think it minimizes the importance of it to say it that way because it does have serious consequences. Um, like I said, I know you've had training on this already, but just a quick review. We all have implicit bias. And this is a place where I'm not gonna be able to hear anybody except for Jessica and Donna, if they choose to join me. But what I would like is I'm going to count to three and we are all gonna say those four words, I have implicit bias, I have implicit bias, out loud, even if I can't hear you because it's important to vocalize it. So, ready? One, two, three. I have implicit, I have implicit bias. bias. And so the question here isn't, am I biased? Don't ask yourself that question. You are biased. I am biased. It's the way our brain works. It puts things into categories and schemes for the purposes of categorization, which you probably learned about in your other lesson. So instead, the question we need to ask is, where do my biases come from? And how do they show up in my life? Because our biases can predict our behaviors and they can sort of start to influence our interactions with students. So like I said, I didn't wanna beat something too much that, oh, that was a violent metaphor, talk about something too much that you um, already know about, but I wanted just to make sure to introduce it because the frame is important within our conversation. So then another barrier to interacting and teaching across social identities is microaggressions. And I'm just gonna introduce the concept and show a couple and then see if we can think about other places where they come to the forefront. So am I aware of commonplace microaggressions? What is a microaggression? It's a brief and commonplace um, verbal or inverbal or nonverbal, excuse me, indignity. And it can be intentional or unintentional that communicates hostile derogatory or negative put down slights and insults to people from marginalized groups that really imply you don't belong, you're less than. And a microaggression can appear to be a compliment, but it contains a meta communication or a hidden insult to, to the targeted group to which it's delivered. They're often outside the conscious of awareness that the person that's committing them because they might come across as a compliment, which means they can be unintentional. And so we're going to watch two examples of microaggressions from the MTV PSAs on them. And I will just let you sort of see around my screen for a minute and then I won't have to go back and forth anymore and I will refresh. So there are two of these PSAs from MTV that have to deal with um, thinking about education and schooling. We'll watch the first one. By the way, I got in. Oh my God, where? Columbia. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. How'd you get into that school? How did I get into that school? 
Does she think I'm not smart enough? And don't bring up affirmative action. I've earned this. It is an ethos that is echoed in countless political speeches, works of literature, and films. Sounds great, Diego. Hmm, thank you. You're so well-spoken. Thanks. Where are your parents from again? Guatemala. Why? Because your English is so good. My English is so good. I'm from here. I grew up speaking English and Spanish. Why don't people get that? Okay, so I wanted to show just a couple examples related to education to see what microaggressions look like in practice. Those were sort of the you speak English so well is complimentary and yet what goes behind it is sort of backbiting. And that's why you saw the shards of glass coming at them, right? Because often we talk about microaggressions as like lots of tiny paper cuts or, you know, lots of tiny cuts time after time that might not look that um, that bad, I'm going to put quotes around that to others seeing them, but if you get then a comment like that, three, four, five, six, multiple times a day, multiple days a week, they really start to add up. So that is what a microaggression looks like. And I had a question. What are some other microaggressions that may come up in a teaching and learning environment? If there's anything that you can think of in terms of a microaggression that might come up in our teaching and learning environments between students, between a professor and a student. Reading level and commenting sort of on that. And just assuming like that we all want to go around the class and like read parts out loud. Sometimes I do that with ground rules and things like that. And maybe that wouldn't be the greatest thing to do. Comments about dress, assuming they don't know something. You're a PGY 20, aren't you? Must be something that really relates to your campus or else I'm just missing something. But I know that you know if it's a microaggression, gender-based, professionalism, yeah, I had um, a boss that, that questioned whether or not um, we could even wear denim to school as faculty, which, you know, in a, in a teaching uh, medical school, maybe that's not an option for you, but like as arts and sciences faculty, it should be an option for us. And so when people sort of question things that should be there, it can make us double think. Telling a learner you've come a long way in your understanding of the subject. It's a compliment, but then it also says maybe you are behind. Great examples. I'll wait just one more second before I forward. Okay. I, so I talked about microaggressions. A lot of times those can be verbal and, and nonverbal, but micro negative micro behaviors are just a little bit smaller. Um, I should say they're small as well, but they're behaviors that show that maybe you're not giving someone your full attention and they then become a barrier to interacting across identities. So, being dismissive of someone um, who's not, you know, the same rank as you or a student in relation to faculty, uh, not thanking people, using nicknames for some people and not for others. The micro behavior there is if, if people want the nickname, they feel left out. Or if the nicknames aren't great, then these people are safe, right? It could go either way. Constantly mispronouncing non-Western names, interrupting a person mid-sentence. So these aren't necessarily tied to a given social identity, right? But they are, um, they are sort of dismissive microbehaviors in general that, that make a barrier for us in terms of interacting and teaching and learning. And so, just didn't know if there was any other ones that y'all could think of, other negative microbehaviors that might come up in a teaching and learning environment. This one's harder. It even took me some time to think of it. Ah, eye rolling for sure.
I think pulling out of the phone, if that happens, hostile demeanor or different tone of voice, yeah. I think for when students, <laughs> air quotes, yeah. Especially if someone says something seriously and you're showing that you don't believe it's a real thing. Absolutely. Um, pulling out of phones is something. Crossing arms can absolutely be a nonverbal defensive behavior that makes us think about something differently. Calling male doctors doctor and female doctors by first name or Mrs. Um, I always use an example in my gender communication course of I was a chair of my department and around the table with others and our dean at the time, it's not our dean now, so um, I feel like I can say this, you won't know who it was, uh, said, well, let's make a committee to look at that and let's put on Dr. Smith, Dr. Jones, Dr. Roberts and Erica. Literally, and I'm making up those, you know, doctor names or whatever, but it was literally all the men were doctor and I was my first name. I've totally experienced that in a pretty public place, right? When it came across that way and ignoring a person's question consistently. Yes, someone's trying to ask something and you're not noticing it could be considered a negative micro behavior. Thank you for sharing those. Um, how can we use this? I would just want to say that if we think about microaggressions and micro behaviors, if we feel like we're getting these comments or these behaviors where we're shown we don't belong on a regular basis, we don't feel like we belong and we're not gonna have as much attachment and we're not gonna be able to learn as well. So it's important for us to know about common microaggressions so we can hopefully recognize them. And then we'll talk about later about how we can use micro inclusions to compensate for them. And what I would say is, I have probably committed microaggressions before. I shouldn't say that. I know I'm certain I have. Because in some meetings, I, I have people that sort of trigger me and I probably do pull out my phone. It, micro behavior, if not microaggression. And if someone were to call me out and say, hey, I'm not really feeling listened to, I need to not get defensive, right? I need to actually have an attitude of gratitude and humility and say, thank you for that. You're right. I wasn't being my you know, best self here and I will, I will try to do better. So I want us to sort of think of them. We, we introduced them for that purpose. So bias, microaggressions, negative bi micro behaviors can impact negatively our teaching and learning environments. The next thing I want to introduce as another possibility um, as a barrier is ethnocentrism. And I'm sure you've You've all, you're all educated people and you've seen this word before. Um, does ethnocentrism emerge in my thinking about students and their social identity groups? And this is essentially asking, am I aware of my own cultural bias and behavior is the subtext, right? Um, in order to be open to other cultures and social identities, we need to have an understanding of our own cultural um, biases and social identities and how they impact us. We're constantly immersed in our own culture so it's easy to become numb to how it's affecting our behaviors as an educator. I sometimes talk about, well, I will talk about ethnocentrism as like a fog around us that like we don't actually really see it. Or maybe even the air is better, right? Because a fog we might see. It's around us all the time, but we're just so used to it. We don't really even know it's there. So formal definition, ethnocentrism, evaluating others according to preconceptions originating in standards, customs, or dominant ideologies of one's own cultural group, a standpoint from which the people of a cultural group look at themselves, at others, and at society. If we ever hear ourselves thinking about those people, or that way of thinking just doesn't make sense, we might be operating from ethnocentrism. Um, an example for me, about a week ago in class, I got really frustrated. And this was my ethnocentric view as like, what's, what's proper student behaviors? Um, I got pretty frustrated with two of my students. Um, they were clearly not focused in class. They happened to be two um, African-American. I think they would identify themselves as black students. And, um, and they just clearly were not engaged, even though they were supposed to be in small groups and talking. And I was looking through my cultural lens of like teacher and what's proper class etiquette and getting, I found myself getting mad. And so I just asked the two of them to stay after to be my cleaning partners because we need to clean the classrooms for COVID. And it turns out, that when they were in that space, the Breonna Taylor lack of indictment charges had just come out. And as black people, they were feeling like, how can I even be in class right now, let alone engaged when this life was not valued in that way. And so I was really glad that rather than like sort of lashing out, I took a space back and, and did that. But my, but my ethnocentrism of like, this is not proper student behavior um, almost led me to like really alienate those students in a way that maybe I couldn't have recovered from. 
So a question, have you ever ethnocentrically evaluated your students at some point? So like your cultural standards make you judge them in a certain way. And clearly my vulnerability shows that I would have put it agree if not strongly agree. I believe as a diversity education facilitator, you need to share your own stories of where you make mistakes. Okay. Okay, it looks like we're slowing down. We have nine strongly agree, five agree, and one person who strongly disagrees that this has, this has happened to them. Okay. I actually sort of split what you see in the checklist into two things, into white ethnocentrism as well and how that might emerge. What do I mean by this? Um, I would offer that I have been socialized into thinking in a westernized way that I will refer to as white mindedness. And maybe some of you will agree with me and I'm not intending to create defensiveness. I just wanna put us all in the mindset of how whiteness and white mindedness can be sort of, again, that air that surrounds us without our knowledge. And it makes sense that we relate most to the ways that um, we've always done things, but it becomes problematic when we judge other people against that standard. Let me give you just a quick example that puts me in the hot seat. Um, I am on, I go to all of the, the community meetings of the Omaha Community Council for Racial Justice and Reconciliation. And in one of those meetings, um, they just asked at the end, and how do we get race, racial reconciliation in Omaha? And um, some, some black folks started to speak and said some really eloquent things, and then some Latinx people started to speak. And the white people really weren't speaking. And so they said, white people, what do you have to say? Why aren't you speaking? And part of it was because I think we wanted to give space. But then also, um, even when asked, like we hadn't really thought about that question probably as much as people occupying those spaces. So I went back to them later and said, you know, I think that maybe we would get a better response if we did it in this research style. And now that I look at myself after saying that, I'm like, that was really sort of elitist, researchery, white-minded of me to say there was a better way to do it. Maybe they got exactly what they wanted out of that. And it just shows that we have certain ways of knowing that direct us in certain ways of thinking. I'm now training to be a facilitator for the Minnesota Humanity Center on top of the ADL. And our lesson this week was on epistemology or how we know. And I was so struck by a quote from Dr. Amalawe Akintunde on this issue. While he is not white, he realized he had white-minded thinking because of just how he'd been socialized because he was reading a book and was you know a lot of the way through it. And all of a sudden they talked about a tall black man well, they talked about lots of other characters before, but that was where they decided to put race and it marked it for him. And he said, I noted that whiteness was so normal, so natural, so deeply subconsciously entrenched in my knowing that it's what you know when you don't know, that's what you know. It's what you know when you don't know, it's what you know. So think on that idea for just a minute and let's do another poll. I have had white-minded thinking at some point. And again, just asking because it can be a barrier to interacting across social identities. Oh, okay. <laughs> Looks like we're all in the um, agree area and some strongly's. Thank you. And again, I'm not wanting to make us defensive, just sort of like talking about the air that surrounds us. So these next three things all sort of go together in terms of being actual illustrations of white-minded thinking. Fear of open conflict, defensiveness, and a right to comfort. What do I mean by a fear of open conflict? When we have a fear of open conflict, basically if someone raises an uncomfortable issue, like individual or systemic racism or something in our classroom, the response is to blame the person for raising the issue, rather than to look at the issue which is actually causing the problem. And so yesterday at Faculty Senate, someone wanted to introduce something and they said, I hate to bring this up, but, which sort of shows, right, that conflict isn't necessarily welcome there. So to try to correct for this, we need to be mindful that in learning, sometimes it takes hard questions and there's a difference between being polite and raising hard issues to get us past a fear of open conflict. I think you all could define defensiveness for me, but when someone is getting defensive, they're gonna enact self-protection in the form of maybe righteous indignation or innocent victimhood in an attempt to ward off a perceived attack. So right now I told you I'm teaching a white privilege class or Jessica told you. And if someone's feeling defensive about that, they might have righteous indignation of, I didn't choose to be white 
or um, innocent victimhood of I can't help what white people did in the past to sort of try to stop talking about it. That serves as a barrier, right, to being able to uh, examine how it might actually be happening. And I imagine some of these things might come up surrounding health disparities in your fields. And especially if you feel like students are questioning you personally on that, it would be easy to get defensive. So try to resist that personal thing and to think about systems. And then finally, what's a right to comfort? Um, projecting a right to comfort is this idea that when someone feels like they have, there's an unspoken belief that certain people have the right to emotional and psychological comfort in the situation. And typically those people have dominant idea, identities. So as examples, white people decide when they want to talk about race and when they don't. And cisgender people will decide someday what we're going to do about the bathroom issue. And able-bodied people are going to decide what reasonable accommodations are, et cetera. And if these issues are brought up and the dominant group isn't ready to talk about them, the person who introduced it will likely be scapegoated. So what we need to remember sort of at, as the antidote is that discomfort's the root, root of all of our growth and we need to sort of welcome it. So with that, if you had to pick one, which of these three barriers related to white-minded thinking do you need to overcome in your teaching and learning, in your teaching and student interactions? Hey, it looks like fear of open conflict and defensiveness are pretty close and they're all still growing. So we can all see how these might emerge in us as well. So these are, I wanted to go through like some barriers so that then we can think about what are the best ways to interact, teach and learn across social identities. And just a quick question to start this, I'm familiar with the Jesuit charism of Cure Personalis and we are now on your worksheet page four. I see a strongly agree, strongly disagree. Okay, looks like we're leaning towards disagree. So what I would just say is the Jesuit charism of pure personalis is care for the whole person. And so what it says is that we really need to think about people individually and maximize the presence of the personal. We need to think about our students as whole people that have lives outside of being a student. And so this first part of the checklist relates to that. How do we maximize the presence of the personal and get to know our students as individuals? We've talked about this already. When you first meet your students, don't make assumptions about their social identities. Instead, listen and ask meaningful questions to learn more about them, then remember what they say. So right now I have a student who's in my uh, color, color Brave class who, um, her dad's a cop, and I'm sure it's real hard for her to hear us talk about police brutality and things. And so since I remembered that about her, I asked her to stay after class and help me clean. And of course, we are really cleaning too, and just sort of asked how that's going for her, to show her, I see you, I hear you, and I want you to know that like, I know this could be hard for you. And also we wanna focus on a student's unique traits as opposed to just their identity groups. My nephew is trans and someday he just wants to be known as a man versus a trans man, right? So like not letting the identity group be the thing that limits them, but just part of who they are. So how can we get better at this? I'm gonna just go through a few things. One is to adopt the Ignatian principle of always assume good intent and ask for that same grace. So this principle stems from Ignatian spirituality um, to start with the assumption that everyone's doing their best. And by assuming good intent, we give space for grace and build good relationships. I can't tell you how many times with teaching via Zoom, I've said to my students, please give me some grace. And this is easier to say than to do, right? I mean, this can be hard at times because we all have our own triggers. Um, in my class last week, a student used the word ghetto about five times in his question about five times and my arm hairs were just standing up. But when he was done, all I said was, before I answer your question, I just wanna note that we really try not to use ghetto as a descriptor unless there's a clear reason to, and I explained why. And he apologized and thanked me for the correction and we moved on. And it could have gone a very different way if I had assumed malintent on his part. So by assuming good intent, we approach the issue um, in a more gentle and approachable way that lets us build our relationship. 
think the next one self-explanatory to deepen our relationships with people in other identity groups. And then the third one here is was a little too deep to get into in a in a one hour um, training, but to think about the multifaceted nature of identities because they stack on each other, right? They come together in intersections rather than focusing on one aspect. So I'm never just a professor. I'm a professor and a mom and a jazzercise instructor and all the other things that go into that. So intersectionality is sort of like a next step from this as you're thinking about programming. So knowing that intersectional is like thinking about the layers of your student identities. In my teaching, I am frequently mindful of my students' interactional identities. Okay, so we're getting a little bit out of the strongly and into the agrees. I would say I would probably start doing the same thing I because of the frequently. I don't always think about this, even if I should. And so it's just something for us to be mindful of. Um, I told you I would talk about the antidote. I mean, it can never solve them, but at least to try to help with microaggressions. And I love the new concept that's getting talked about more and more of micro inclusions. Micro, I'm sorry, my cat just woke up. Micro inclusions as little symbolic acts of humanity, small, subtle words, phrases, and gestures that we use in our interactions to help encourage others to feel comfortable, heard, seen, respected. So verbally, a self-introduction with your pronouns, she, her, hers for me. Remembering names and pronouncing them correctly, letting someone finish their sentence, using inclusive language could be verbal ways. Non-verbally, am I making eye contact and smiling and paying attention to someone talking, leaning forward, not shying away are ways that I show, excuse me, micro inclusions. And so what we wanna do is raise our implicit bias to the level of intention to counteract it with these daily opportunities of inclusion um, it's not knowing everything about everyone. It's about trying and learning and growing to do these micro inclusions. Two more things, and then we'll be to questions. Um, I wanted to just say that to really do this effectively across social identities, we need to be ready to respond and speak up behaviors to behaviors in the teaching and learning environment that seem discriminatory or inappropriate, including they, them, and we, the, we, us language. Um, we need to be prepared to respond rather than to react. So when we see this happening in our classroom, we need to choose what to do next. And um, if we focus on responding versus reacting, we're probably always going to come out more thoughtful. Think about what's the best way to handle the situation. One time, all I did in class was said, so-and-so, I'm not really sure how I felt about that comment. And I let it just sit there. And it was enough that everybody knew that something went down and that we would probably need to debrief it. But um, I didn't react, right? I was su super calm about it. And, but we need to think that like that might not always be enough. That regardless of someone's intent, if they say something that comes across as discriminatory or offensive, some behaviors can have a negative impact and they're gonna require a dialogue about impact and intent. And so I did wanna ask this question just on behalf of your programmers. I feel prepared to intervene and speak up when there are discriminatory or inappropriate comments in my teaching and learning environment. So, so far we don't have many, oh, somebody's in the strong lease. Oh, on both sides now. Okay, a lot of people pre feel pretty um, feel pretty prepared. I would say one of the things I always start with is what did you mean by that? And sometimes that question can solve a lot just with itself. So my last slide um, is actually just, I don't know as much about your content. This is sort of where I feel least prepared to help you, but we can think about with identities ways to adapt our teaching practices. And we'll just look at those bullets really quick and then um, see what you think. So we could adapt our teaching practices in terms of thinking about our pedagogical content and if there are ways to reflect the different social identities of your students. So do you feel like the students in the room are represented in the scholars that you are looking at? And can they be? Sometimes they can't always be, but if so, we, we wanna think about that. 
Be open to students' reactions to the course material. Model an acceptance and appreciation for different ideas, opinions, and learning styles. So sometimes students are going to react to how groups are represented and we need to be ready for that. And how can we model like that we're listening to their concerns. Be careful not to respond to comments in ways that students might interpret as dismissive. And then make sure that we've looked through the course content for inaccurate information, whose narratives are absent, and questionable portrayals of certain groups are ways that I don't know exactly what that looks like in all of your medical teaching versus mine, but ideas that might transcend. And so actually, I feel like I didn't spend enough time on that to have you do a question. So we'll just do one more. In a few words, what is your biggest takeaway from us talking about sort of being mindful of identities, recognizing barriers to working across identities, and then best tips for interacting across identities? Okay, mindful of microaggressions, bias, reduce our defensiveness. Think before we speak, how might we construct reduce defensiveness? Okay, I'm gonna wait for just a minute. Actually, um, I can, Jessica, you can start before I, without me stopping sharing my screen so we can let people still put some takeaways up. I know we got time for probably just a couple questions. Okay, great. We, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Kirby, for giving us some tools as we're working with diverse social identities. Um, and so we really appreciate your presentation. And we do have a couple questions and um, comments also. So on the first question, they put this up when you were talking about microaggressions. Okay. So the question is, what is it called when the same slides are directed toward a member of a non-marginalized group. Oh, I get the, yeah, because a lot of times we wouldn't call them aggressive microaggressions because they are, um, they're not gonna get them in the same ways. I mean, I guess we would, we could just still say they're verbal and non-verbal indignities. They're still put downs, they're still slights and things. But if it's not based on a category of social identity, we, you're right, we usually don't call them microaggressions, but I think we could use almost all aspects of the definition of what the impact of the behavior is. Okay, all right, thank you. And the next question is, do you have any thoughts about intellectual curiosity about others? I guess I'm not sure. I so is it that like, we don't wanna tokenize people or how we just, how we ask about others? I don't know if they will put. Um, I was going to say, can someone clarify? Maybe we respond to the other. Clarifying. I'm um, happy to try. Um, and maybe while they um, put some clarification in there, let me yeah. read the last comment. Yeah. Um, so, as there is behavior set for being white minded, is there one for being black or Latino minded? And oh. as we, as, they also said that as we are. Um, talking about this, maybe we could be using left-minded, middle-minded, right-minded. Um, those yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, I think ethnocentrism would show us that every cultural group is going to have a certain mindedness. And um, I just introduced white-mindedness partially because I'm white, but also I think as the dominant narrative, it sort of structures like what do we see as good? What do we see as good manners or whatever? A lot of times it is the dominant narratives, ide um, identities, way of doing things. But it doesn't mean that there isn't also like we're all socialized into patterns. So there certainly are those. It's just do you get to enact your Latinx mindedness in the workplace or not? Because it's a white minded workplace is how I would respond to that. So that that impetus would still be there. And certainly we could start. Hopefully. We, eventually, we won't have these divisions in knowledge so much that we won't have to talk about them that way. Right. And I am I am going to do this last question. I know we are tight on time, but I think this is a really good one. Our last yeah. question is, how can we help residents and students from microaggressing each other, even when they express comfort with um, another race or the teasing that goes on? How can we help encourage them to not have that kind of microaggression? I think that it did it, it partially. I think when people think some oh it's just a joke or it's funny that they might think it's okay. So I really do think that 
if you can find students who maybe even like, it might even be a campaign about like how I really feel when you say these things, right? Because I think that students sometimes, um, and, and adults, uh, your residents are definitely adults, um, think that in the spirit of humor, it's okay to say them. And it might have been the first time I heard it that day, but the seventh or eighth, right? It just, it's so, so it's this idea of, is it really ever the best use of humor to talk about another group? I have always said that it, if you're gonna use humor, sometimes it about your own group, at least no one can say that you're sort of attacking them. But I do think that, and I don't know if it would take a training to get people to do that, or if that's something that there's like an introduction in, on the way into the curriculum about like, you know, interactions with each other. I don't know where exactly that well, would Well, I did fall. like how you handled some of those microaggressions in your own class. And I think we yeah. can do that with our residents, with our students that we can say, um, let, I'm going to stop you right there. Let's let's think of another word to use, or yeah. that's probably not appropriate. Um, and so, just actually saying it out loud to them, or asking them a question. I really like your tool that you gave us about just asking a question. What do you mean by that? Yeah, and come across where we're not defensive, but we are able to get to the bottom of um, how somebody is um, feeling about words that somebody else is using, so. Yeah. And I can even think of just really quickly, like I called a student the wrong name and she said, actually my name is yada yada. And I apologized profusely in class and I, I have a, like a texting thing and I texted her afterwards, like I micro included my face off to try to like combat that, right? So that's the, the thinking about micro inclusions I think is something we didn't used to talk about and we should talk about more. Right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. When you get off, please take the um, survey, give us some feedback about the faculty development session today. And thank you so much once again, Dr. Kirby. Thank you.